Welcome to the Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions speaker series. I'm Trevor Bechtel, facilitator of this series with Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan and instructor of a course that accompanies the series. Over these seven weeks, we are introducing the key issues regarding the causes and consequences of poverty in this virtual space, featuring experts in policy and practice from across the nation. We are an audience of students enrolled in the course, community members, academics, policymakers, and interested people from Southeast Michigan and beyond. And we are really excited about today's session with researchers from the Understanding Communities of Deep Disadvantage Project at Poverty Solutions, Jasmine Simington, Nora Johnson, and Meg Duffy along with our principal investigator, H. Luke Schaefer. But before we dig into this conversation, I want to remind our viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag Poverty Solutions. We have several questions from students in the course to start us off, and we look forward to a meaningful conversation and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We welcome an open and respectful dialogue, and I want to let folks know that we will be responsive to any inappropriate content. I invite you to check out our resources, tune in for additional events, and find other ways to connect with other poverty research at our website, poverty.umich.edu. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Luke Schaefer is the Faculty Director of Poverty Solutions, author of Two Dollars a Day, and Principal Investigator on the Understanding Communities of Deep Disadvantage Project, along with Kathy Eden, his co-author on Two Dollars a Day, and Timothy Nelson. Jasmine Simington is a PhD candidate in Public Policy and Sociology at the University of Michigan. Her research explores how housing policies shape spatial inequality and the contemporary racialization of local housing markets. Jasmine was embedded in Marion County, South Carolina, as a part of the Understanding Communities of Deep Disadvantage Project. Meg Duffy is a recent graduate from the University of Michigan, where she received her master's in public policy and public health. Her work focuses on the role of policies in perpetuating health disparities by race. Meg was also embedded in Marion County, South Carolina, as a part of this project. And Lenora Johnson is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Michigan. Her work focuses on rural poverty and shifting gender dynamics in central Appalachia using qualitative data. Lenora collected data in Marion County, South Carolina and Clay County, Kentucky for the Deep Disadvantage Project. Really excited to have all of you here today for this and I'll turn it over to you, Luke. Thanks, Trevor. And uh... Well, I was going to say before Trevor goes, but um, I know we can hear in the background. I just wanted to say happy birthday. Uh, and happy birthday. You know, Trevor happy is an incredibly, birthday. incredibly valuable member of the Poverty Solutions team. Um, he does so much to increase student engagement. And he's also just a really wonderful colleague. And, you know, Trevor, we all really value everything you bring to um, bring to the team and bring to our community and the passion and this student uh, class being one of them. So when Trevor and I started this, it had, um, we started with 12 uh, students and now we're up to 60. So happy birthday and, and thanks for all you do. Thanks, Luke. Um, selfishly, I uh, thank Trevor because uh, with the speaker series, I'm like having the I'm having like the most fun I've ever had working. With, right. <laughs> so uh, last last week I got to interviewed Dr. Joni Caldoun and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist and just was um, enthralled and really enjoyed that opportunity. And I'm also extremely excited to uh, get to spend time today with three uh, collaborators who I really enjoy and respect and have just um, benefited from working with all three of you and uh, look forward to more of the same as we, we keep going. So. I'm gonna just uh, talk a little bit about the the broader project that all of this work um, sits in, and then uh, I'm gonna get to do some interviewing, starting with Meg and and then Jasmine and then and then Nora. 
So um, as Trevor mentioned, a number of years ago, Kathy Eden and I wrote a book called $2 a Day. It was about families with very low cash income. So families in the United States who um, often have access to food assistance through SNAP, and some have housing, although housing is fairly rare, but they didn't have any money. And what does that look like? And um, what does it mean when every single data set that we've looked at shows sort of an increase in this number of families? But it was really a story about families and people, and it was a story about um, macro level policy. And so a few years ago, the um, Robert Woods Johnson Foundation came to us and said, could you do something like that at the, at the community level, right? Could you talk about disadvantage not among people and society, but sort of that community level of analysis? And we thought that was, we thought that was really interesting and not something that is done a whole lot. I think I have spent most of my career talking about things like um, catch assistance, right? And food, food assistance and all of these um, federal level policies uh, and how states administer them is often important. But what about the communities where people live and should we be looking at disadvantage at that level as well? So we wanted to take sort of a set of tools in, in the work that we did in $2 a day, uh, we started to sort of hone in on something uh, that we referred to as iterative mixed methods. And so the idea here is that you have both quantitative analysis that you're sort of looking at big data, right? And trying to see what those data are telling you. And also qualitative analysis that allows you to dig deeper, right? And try, try to really understand. And I think a really important part about qualitative analysis is especially from the positionalities of a lot of people who do this kind of work, right? When, when I'm studying poverty in the United States from my office in Ann Arbor, I think sometimes I don't even know the right questions to ask, right? Um, I'm, I'm blinded from big dynamics. And I might go into a community and assume I've read all this literature and I know the biggest issues that they're confronting and really um, the ones that are on people's minds might not even be in the top 50 or 100 of the issues. So in Detroit, we've seen that play out in our work. Um, and we went in and formed a partnership with um, Mayor Duggan uh, on economic mobility and are involved in a lot of what the, what the city does around economic mobility. An issue that was nowhere near the top of my mind was auto insurance, right? But it turns out uh, Detroit has the highest auto insurance rates in the country. And that sort of gets enmeshed in a lot of other interlinked systems. So we really think by bringing these streams together, right? By starting by asking questions, by often assuming as scholars and analysts and even policymakers that we don't automatically know what are in people's minds, we can learn a lot more, right? About what's going on and often figure out places where we can, we can intervene. So when we think about, when we thought about how we wanted to do this project, we knew a couple of things. I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes about the index of d deep disadvantage that especially Jasmine played a critical role in helping us develop. Um, so how we've been thinking about that and some of those results. And then, and then we're gonna talk about the qualitative work. Um, but uh, when we think about, uh, we wanted to start out with um, thinking about community level disadvantage, right? Sort of a new way to approach things for us. And we also wanted to rank communities um, across a number of different metrics, right? So the idea is that disadvantage or vulnerability, we can have a great debate about what the right terms are to use. Um, it comes across in multiple dimensions. And really to see the whole, uh, we have to look at a lot of different kinds of data, right? And understand them. And that can, that can tell us more about what's going on from a data perspective. It also can be used to buffer against the weaknesses of any one measure, right? So we might just want to go in and use income poverty rates um, as a way to uh, assess communities. But that only really does tell us uh, one piece of the puzzle, right? It doesn't tell us about the underlying health of, of communities. It doesn't tell us about the trajectory of communities. Um, so it's a piece, but it's not everything. And, and we also know that there are weaknesses to any one metric, including that. So together, we think they can paint a more holistic picture of disadvantage mm -hmm. than any single one can on their own. So there could be endless 
uh, metrics that we look at. And we like to look at a number of them, but we had the pick, right? And we've tried to create a system that um, would uh, have salience, right? So we sort of thought about what would have salience with um, like the American public. So we thought resources was a piece of this. So we've loaded in community level poverty rates and deep poverty rates to sort of understand the level of low income in a community. But then we think there's a lot of salience to health, right? And understanding how healthy people are, um, what the longevity of life is. We think of like life expectancy as like the ultimate well-being question, uh, but also wanting to pay attention to what goes on with infants. So loading in measures on uh, the percent of births that are low birth weight. And then we think mobility, right, from the work of Nathaniel Hindren and his collaborator, oh yeah, Raj Chetty. Um, mobility has a special place, I think, in um, our, our idea of what it means for communities to be uh, vibrant and for people to be able to live healthy and productive lives. So we were able to pull on this incredible data that they brought together, sort of looking at tax records of a cohort of people to say, where were kids in the income spectrum during um, childhood and where are they in early adulthood? So we wanted to sort of create an index that was based on these measures, right? So we have five measures here representing three domains that we think are of high salience uh, to Americans. And uh, we wanted to make it sort of a robust, so we've done a lot of testing, we brought in sort of labor market force, labor force participation, we've brought in education rates. And we see that in this case, all of these five metrics sort of give us a piece of the puzzle that any single one doesn't, right? You can see that from this correlation table. So these things are, are strongly correlated, but not at 100%. And so you're both getting a consistent sort of message across them and also some variation. Um, and so we think they can build a, a better picture. And we used um, partially Jasmine and our, our uh, collaborator, uh, Sylvia's brainchild principal component analysis, which is this fairly straightforward statistical technique to take a set of variables, look for um, you know where they are the same, right? Look where they correlate, look for the difference, and then create a new set of variables that's simply a linear combination of the original features. So we're gonna standardize these features, load them into the principal component analysis, and it takes advantage of all these variables to create an index of disadvantage, right? Where we can rank from number one on this index, the most disadvantaged community uh, to um, the very end of the most advantage. Now, what is a community, right? That's sort of like the biggest problem, the biggest challenge in this. And for us, there's a practical concern. We wanna have consistent data across multiple dimensions and multiple data sources. So that rules out using census tracts because we can't get as much across all census tracts in a consistent way. We end up having to use counties, right? And we know counties can be big and heterogeneous, uh, but they're the unit, right, that we um, can see consistent data uh, across the entire country. But we know also cities sort of play an important role in um, poverty research. And so we don't wanna remove cities, we wanna understand them. So I think uh, maybe for the first time in a study, we load in both all counties in the United States and add the 500 largest cities as well, right? And that gets us down to cities that are pretty small in size, about 40,000. So we can do what we think is a, a an apples to apples comparison of counties and cities on virtually identical metrics, right? And see sort of where the, the disadvantage across all of these factors lies. And this is the map that we've created. And if you go to our website, I'll make sure I put it in the link in a few minutes. Uh, you can actually access this map and you can you can scroll over it and find out about any community that you're interested in. Uh, but this gives the the broad overview, right? And it and it shows like the as as the um, as counties get bluer, right? As the as the as there's more shading in these counties, you're seeing more disadvantage. And then uh, the lighter blue, right, is is the ones that sort of rank most advantaged on our index. And and we were struck, right, that there um, are some some clear clusters of deep disadvantage where you can sort of go down the the Mississippi Delta and through the deep south, um, some a clustering in Appalachia, and then on tribal lands. 
And we also saw some of the benefits of using different metrics. So one of the things we identified was looking down at another sort of cluster of uh, more disadvantaged counties on the tip of Texas. Uh, we were interested to see that these communities often have very high poverty rates, but they also have high rates of mobility and, and some of the health, health outcomes look very good, right? So we start to see that sort of gives us more to unpack and to understand what's going on rather than just using one metric on its own. Another thing that becomes clear is that maybe when uh, poverty research, which is focused almost completely on urban poverty, right, for every I would say 100 books or articles on urban poverty, we might have one or two on rural poverty. If we look at this index anyways, about um, who's ranking of the, say the 100 most, this is just you know arbitrary cutoff of the, the 100 most vulnerable, the 100 most disadvantaged places, only nine of them are among the 500 largest cities. And 19 are actually rural counties in Mississippi alone. And 21 are uh, counties that include tribal lands. So that tells us a couple of things that we've sort of missed, I think, when we have a focus on urban spaces, right? That's an important piece of the puzzle, but we should be doing more to understand rural poverty because some of our deepest disadvantage across all of these metrics is present there. It also, I think, tells us that um, these places, these clusters, right, that you just saw in the last map tend to be connected to places of uh, long-term exploitation. And in fact, when we take this map, right, that I already showed you, and we zero in on um, just the Southeast region of it, we can compare this map to a map of enslavement in 1860. So on your left is our map, right, using data from the 2010s to 2020, of uh, deep disadvantage, the uh, um, concentration of it. And if we compare that to a map of enslavement that is concentrated in exactly the same way, so the darker the shading, the higher the proportion of the population that's enslaved, we see that not only are there sort of general similarities in the patterns, but the shading itself, right? The, the grading of the map really corresponds. And as we started to run models, we see the rate of enslavement in a community, the rate of segregation using Logan and Parman uh, segregation estimates from 1900, um, and a lot of other factors that date back 80 to 150 years are highly correlated and actually predict a huge amount of the variation in our community poverty rates or community mobility rates um, in the 21st century. So to me, that speaks to the fact that I've always sort of thought about history, I've always done work I think that gives a nod to history, right? understands where we've been, but really treats programs mostly as um, ahistorical. And maybe history is a much bigger piece of the puzzle than at least I appreciate it. Our final slide looks at some of the numbers. So when we compare the 100 most disadvantaged places in this index to the 100 most advantaged, we see the poverty rate is many times higher, the deep poverty rate even more so, deep poverty really in the data doesn't, you know, 2.4%, um, an eighth of the size of the 100 most advantaged. There's a 10 year gap in life expectancy, uh, double the rate of low infant birth weight. In the 100 most advantaged places, if you grow up low income, you're actually, your uh, income as an adult is above the median, right? So social mobility is alive and well in these places, but, um, your income rank among 100 most disadvantaged is 20 points lower. And then finally, we find that these most disadvantaged places are some of our most uh, unequal, right? So one of the criticisms of the work is maybe it doesn't understand, you know, it doesn't appreciate how unequal our cities are. Um, but in fact, the, this mainly rural set of spaces is, um, is quite unequal, right? Above, well above the average. It's also a, a very racially diverse place. Um, where uh, we often, I think, make the mistake of thinking of rural America as, as um, predominantly white. And that is not the case, right, in these 100 most disadvantaged places. So that was really our starting place, right? And we can have lots of debates about the index and what factors should be in and what factors shouldn't be. But we use this index to start to get to know places. So Marion County, right, I think ranks about um, 130 or 140 on our index. And Meg and Jasmine uh, spent 
eight weeks there last summer and have been in close contact ever since. And Clay County is uh, number 36 on our index, right, in Appalachia. And Nora spent part of her summer in both places last year. And that's really where the exploration began. So I want to ask Meg to maybe start us off, right? So in thinking about this question, like, when you went in and you had sort of ideas maybe about what this experience was going to be like or what were going to be the big issues on the plate, um, were you right or did things surprise you? Did issues come up that you maybe weren't thinking of before you went in? I would definitely say that we were surprised by the issues that arose, predominantly about disaster recovery. This was something that was not top of mind, I think, for anyone on our team um, as we were going into South Carolina. It wasn't something we had discussed as a team and it wasn't on our interview guides. So There's no sort of systematic questioning we did around disaster recovery, but it came up in more than 75% of the interviews we conducted in Marion County. Um, pretty shortly after we moved down there, we learned that this community had been hit three times in the past five years by really severe storms, starting with a flood in 2015, followed by Hurricane Matthew in 2016, and then Hurricane Florence in 2018. And we heard about these storms, but it really kind of um, really came home for us when we met the mayor of Sellers, South Carolina. Sellers is a, just a really tiny town, only about 200 people. And the mayor has been mayor for 10 years, so she knows everybody. But um, she was able to walk with Jasmine and Nora around the town and show how people were still living in homes with mold, still living in homes that were partially destroyed by um, floods that had happened years ago. And so that really made us, made it very clear for our team that even though this wasn't something that we had originally intended to study, it was something that was a huge issue and that was top of mind for a lot of the residents that we worked with. And why is it um, that uh, folks who are lower income have trouble accessing disaster relief? Tell us a little bit about the, the process and, and what are the, um, different mechanisms by which aid comes in and and how do people experience them yeah absolutely i think the um i think i kind of want to talk about two different women that we met one was the very first person that jasmine sat down with um, who had started an application to access federal disaster recovery funds in 2015 when she had um, experienced a flood and by the time that she got together all the different application pieces the program had closed and it was no longer accepting applications. And so for her, the sort of arduousness of the application process really got in her way. Um, and we did find that that application process is such a gauntlet. Um, in order to apply for the FEMA Individuals and Households Program, for example, you need to provide proof of income, proof of residency, uh, proof of home ownership, which are really difficult to provide um, particularly in the trauma of losing everything in a hurricane and being displaced, it's just incredibly difficult to get these things together. And we learned while we were on the ground that some of these programs have very high rejection rates. And so for the FEMA Individuals and Households Program, you talked about the iterative mixed methods. We heard about it on the uh, in the field. And then looking back into it more when we came back to Ann Arbor, we learned that after the 2015 severe storm, 70% of applicants for the Individuals and Households Program for housing assistance um, from Marion County were rejected. And similarly, after Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Florence, approximately 50% of applicants were rejected. And so people came to feel that these programs were capricious, that there was an, an algorithm that was just splitting out sort of um, automatic denials. And so there was a lot of distrust that built up. Um, also, it, it deserves to be said that when millions of dollars are allocated at the federal level and people hear about that on the on the news, um, they hear about it from their friends that that aid money has been set aside to help their community, but they don't see that disaster recovery happening at the local level. There are a wide variety of effects that we we saw in the county, including intense mistrust of both FEMA and the government itself. Um, we saw the perception of procedural injustice people could kind of sense that something was fishy if there was millions of dollars that was meant to help them and they were still living in a home surrounded by mold or maybe they had um, family members who had died or while they were waiting for a home. Um, this type, type of um, mm -hmm. injustice was really felt very acutely by people. There was also yeah. misinformation. Um, so people <laughs> would hear things like the 
uh, FEMA will put a lien on your home or FEMA will take your home if you apply for aid. And these things caused a lot of, of fear. Um, and they made it so that one woman we met uh, who's, we use pseudonyms to talk about everyone in our study to protect their privacy, but we call her Eliza Harrison. She was a 90 year old woman that Jasmine and I sat down with at her daughter's kitchen table. She had been displaced for around uh, 10 months um, and she wanted nothing more than to get back into her home, but um, was so disillusioned with the process that she wouldn't answer FEMA's phone calls. She would not talk to FEMA representatives because she felt like they had really broken their promises to her. And so both these sort of structural um, barriers, like the high rejection rates and the slowness, as well as um, these sort of inter interpersonal factors, like the mistrust that builds up, um, really got in the way of, of achieving successful disaster recovery in Marion County. Yeah, you mentioned this in your writing, and I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about um, people just like getting angry with FEMA. So can you tell us a little bit more about like, what does that look like and why, um, what is it that sort of leads her to just not even want to take FEMA's phone call? Absolutely. So um, after the first uh, application period for federal disaster relief aid, it essentially passed without many people um, either applying um, or starting their application process, but not making it quite all the way through. And part of the reason for that was that um, people just didn't really trust FEMA or maybe they had heard that their friend was rejected or their neighbor was rejected from this program. And so they didn't really see FEMA as like a viable way to get funds. And so when we talked to the Marion County Long Term Recovery Group, they said that some of the FEMA representatives had reached out to them to help uh, tell people about the opportunities for uh, home repair and replacement assistance, things like that. Mm -hmm. And yet when Marion County Long Term Recovery partnered with FEMA to put on an event to tell people about um, to tell people about these available programs, people wouldn't show up. Um, people would would show up or say, that's not gonna happen. I've seen firsthand how my cousin was rejected, my neighbor was rejected, um, even though people are experiencing incredibly high levels of damage. And so there's a, such a level of distrust that, that built up very quickly because I think with also the repeated storms, 2015, 2016, yep. 2018, when you know that people still haven't received help from storms that happened years ago, you become very distrustful that um, now if you apply, you will actually receive a benefit. Yeah. So you say this sort of, uh, in your writing, do you argue, uh, this creates a sort of a, a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop in like the sense that people see people don't get um, help, they've had problems themselves and, um, and that becomes self-reinforcing. Absolutely. Yeah. Jasmine, you've sort of delved into a piece of this puzzle, but a broader issue too. And that's, um, as, as Meg mentioned, um, getting access to disaster relief uh, funds are um, proving ownership of the land is a key piece of that. And in a lot of cases, that's um, not possible. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, um... One of the groups of people we encountered a lot in Marion County were people um, who are considered air property owners. And so um, what heirs property is, is it's a form of collective home ownership. We usually think of home ownership as individually based, but um, heirs property is actually um, ownership between multiple family members um, of a property that has been passed down through the family. Um, and the reason that this, uh, these groups of owners um, struggle to access the disaster recovery aid is because as an heirs property owner, they lack clear title. And for those of us who don't think about property records very often, what that means is that um, the title doesn't explicitly state who was the formal owner of this property. And FEMA, as a result, doesn't recognize homeowner, heirs property owners as formal homeowners. Um, that's also true for a lot of other federal agencies um, who provide services. So um, as you can imagine, that's a huge barrier for people who are being told to apply to FEMA and then putting that application through and learning, oh, we don't actually recognize you as a homeowner um, at the federal level. So that creates a lot of the confusion that Meg was mentioning, and I think um, breeds a lot of the distrust that sort of built up over time. 
And um, so uh, I'm someone, and, and in this case, a lot of folks may have been uh, paying taxes, right? Have may have paid taxes for two generations and um, clearly think, you know, when it, when it came to be taking their money, uh, they were happy to be considered the homeowners. But uh, when it comes to getting help, um, they're not considered a homeowners. Um, exactly. Right? I mean, yeah. um, one of the problems with heirs property ownership is that you don't know that that's the category you fit into. You learn that when you are in the face of displacement or trying to access some program of the federal safety net. Um, and so what we heard, as Luke was saying, is that um, people would try try to prove their home ownership by saying, I've been paying property taxes for this long. I've been spending this amount of money on the home for this long. Um, but that is not considered legal proof of home ownership. And so it didn't really matter for the federal aid that people were getting. So Meg mentioned uh, you all, as you were doing um, some interviews, right? You just, this theme started to emerge and she mentioned a couple of interviews. I just wondered if you had any memories of um, sort of what that was like and when you first sort of took notice of the issue. And I know, uh, you know, I got to meet the, the mayor of Sellers as well. And I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about her story, so. Yeah, um, so I think to start, um, when we were walking around uh, Sellers with the mayor um, and then doing some interviews with people in Sellers, my first inclination was to think that, wow, this is an isolated and unfortunate problem for the town of Sellers in Marion County. Um, but mm -hmm. as we did our iterative mixed methods process and it was very clear that this is actually common across the country. So. Um, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, the problems with Hurricane Maria, mm -hmm. lots of the lots of the barriers to claiming um, FEMA aid is related to people's homeownership status. And so, while it's it was hard to witness how that prevented people from claiming aid in South Carolina, understanding how widespread this issue is. Um, and how common it is, I think is even more disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we've, as we've been studying a little more about heirs property, learning that it's, it's often associated with households in the rural South, but mm -hmm. it shows up across Appalachia, mm -hmm. tribal lands, um, and also in black neighborhoods and urban areas. So it's really, I think um, for us, we we now see it as a much more widespread issue than we originally did and trying to understand what home ownership is uh if there are mm -hmm. these varying legal definitions mm -hmm. um varying spatial definitions of what it means to own property and land mm -hmm. um and just to talk a little bit more about how we continue to work with the mayor of sellers and Marion County, uh, Meg and I are doing a community asset map with the Marion County Coordinating Council, which is a group of service providers in Marion that we met during our field work. And they are trying to close the information gap, the transportation gap. They're trying to do a lot of things. Um, and it's been our pleasure to continue working with the community to, uh, in whatever capacity we can, provide data, um, related to some of the policy and structural issues that they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so continuing to engage with that community. On, on this particular uh, question, actually, of policy, I think Hillary has a, a, one of our students has a video a question. So I'm going to ask Trevor to cue that up for us. Uh, but before I do, let me just ask one more question, Jasmine. Um, why wouldn't somebody, why wouldn't a, um, a family sort of go through the documentation process of getting sort of clear title to their home? Sure, um, it's complicated. So the process is intensive and it requires having access to legal aid. Um, so it's not um, 
ultimately a judge has to be the one to sign off to say that your title is now cleared. You are you f- formally own this yep. property, and so that actually requires sorting through. Uh, generations of family line- lineage mm-hmm. to understand how their property has been passed down across time. So it's really complicated. Um, it again requires both access to and trust of the legal system, which we know we yep. can't always assume happens. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then again, heirs property owners usually don't find out they are heirs property owners until they're very close to displacement um, mm-hmm. or cannot get aid. So it's, it's also- You don't need it until you need it, right? Exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. Trevor, are you ready with Hillary's um, video? Hey, I'm Hillary. I'm a grad student in the School of Social Work. And I was interested in your research. You talk about how people who are experiencing poverty are at a greater risk of experiencing climate disaster. And then you talk about this need to reshape disaster relief assistance, but also think about home ownership. So I'm wondering, do you think our country has learned any lessons from Hurricane Katrina? And then how have those lessons been implemented through policy? Thanks. Yeah, Hillary, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think the way to answer that is to compare the Katrina response to more recent uh, responses like uh, Marion County, Puerto Rico, and Hurricane Harvey in uh, Texas. And I can say there's been some improvement in the Hurricane Harvey recovery uh, process we saw for the first time, FEMA actually partnering with state agencies to help house people in the wake of disaster. Historically, FEMA was the only agency that could actually provide temporary housing for people. And you can imagine, and as Meg said, FEMA sort of coming in as an external partner um, is not always the most efficient way to provide resources and services to a community. So I think I count that as a win. Um, but I will say that um, what we've seen from Puerto Rico and um, in Marion County around these issues of trying to prove home ownership and being rejected by FEMA is still a huge barrier. Um, I think one policy tool we can think about is providing free legal aid to low-income disaster victims to match them with lawyers um, and help them clear their title. Meg, do you have any final policy recommendations on um, how do we sort of fix this mess? Uh, So Alyssa asks about the FEMA rejections. Is it an organizational issue? Are there, are let's say, in a, a presidential administration game and asked you like, how do we write the ship on this a bit? Any other last things before we turn to Nora that you would lift sure. up? Sure, there are both the direct things that we can address like the high rejection rates, which don't really make much sense. You wouldn't wanna have a program where like almost every other person is getting rejected when they're in desperate need of aid. And to Alyssa's question, I can say, um, We know that there's about 35 different reasons why FEMA might reject someone for aid. Um, They include the things that I discussed. It's a lot of reasons. It's a lot of reasons. Um, And they're different for homeowners and renters. And uh, it just, there are so many ways that you can fall through the system, both in documentation, which Jasmine and I both talked about, as well as things like a missed inspection. So let's say you don't have transportation or you're displaced after a storm. If you miss an inspection, um, that can cause you to fall through the cracks. And so, at a policy level, some of it are things like this, where we know that this policy, um, like the application process for this policy is ineffective. So we need to address that. We also obviously need to address the distrust that's come about. I think also being FEMA, uh, or excuse me, Katrina being such a large, um, well-known disaster with such horrible, um, unjust ramifications, I think that that sparks a lot of distrust, even beyond places like Marion County where they've seen it firsthand. And so I think there's also some like reputation development that needs to happen where people will come to see these agencies as trustworthy entities that they want to engage with. We also, I think, need to streamline disaster recovery spending. Um, A lot of the effects that we saw were because there's a gap of months to years from when people lose everything and are displaced to when they actually see some money start to trickle into their community. And so I think if we can speed up that pace on the one end, while on the other end, making some of these programs 
like extending the application period and, and just knowing that for some people it'll take them um, or it'll take the information a long time to reach them. Um, if we can have this sort of flexibility, I think that would go a long way. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to turn to Nora. So one thing, uh, and I've got a question from Kayla that I think is right up sort of the similar lines, but um, one thing that uh, we all know is that issues of equity have sort of uh, have been really on people's minds lately, and how do we make systems more equitable? And uh, when you were embedded in Clay County, you had um, sort of some experience with some equity issues, right, or um, that sort of principle uh, that maybe weren't what we expected either. And uh, let's uh, go ahead and play Kayla's video. And if you wouldn't mind just sort of responding to this question I've raised and sort of um, uh, address what Kayla is asking as well. You created an index of deep disadvantage using measures of poverty, help, and intergenerational mobility. What roles do the stories you hear from communities play into the index? And how do you make sure to address the unique needs of communities when creating poverty solutions? Yeah, um, thank you, Luke and Kayla, for those questions. Um, so I'll start out by saying that, like, when I spent time in Clay County, I had already anticipated hearing a lot about substance use. Um, Eastern Kentucky has been struggling with both the opioid crisis and other kinds of substance use for a while, um, as are a lot of communities around um, the country. Um, but while we were there, we quickly learned that um, there were new concerns about substance use. So, you know, the opioid crisis story is about 10 years behind where Clay County is right now. Um, you know, Clay County uh, and Kentucky in general had a pretty aggressive um, state policy uh, cutting down on overprescription um, back in um, the early 2010s. Um, but in the wake of the opioid crisis, um, uh, those communities are seeing increased use of different kinds of substances, uh, heroin, meth, that kind of, um, uh, mm -hmm. not so much the prescription drug story. Um, and that and the ways that communities were trying to respond to those new concerns um, had created some worries in the community. Um, one participant, Angel, uh, oh. mentioned to me that she was really worried about syringe exchange programs. Um, syringe exchange programs are needle exchanges, um, uh, are, are colloquially known as needle exchanges. They're programs where community members who inject substances can come to um, either a public health service or a different kind of venue and exchange used syringes for clean syringes. This is a really important public health measure. Um, there's no question that syringe exchange services help address the spread of HIV, hepatitis C, and other bloodborne infections, um, especially in Kentucky, where the rate of hepatitis C infections are seven times the national average. Um, but Angel was worried about seeing needles by the side of the roads where her kids played. Um, and she had long been in recovery from substance use herself and had really strong moral beliefs about how one should approach substance use um, and believed that resources going to people who were using substances um, w could be taking away from um, resources for people suffering from different kinds of illnesses um, like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Um, she wasn't alone. The public health director talked to us about how um, she constantly had to push back against um, the kind of belief that, um, that this was an indulgent service rather than something really important for community health. Um, and so I, it, it was a really interesting equity concern because you have a community where lots of people are dealing with lots of different kinds of illnesses and where resources really are strapped. Um, but uh, it, it's no surprise in that kind of context that people find it challenging to accept where resources should go, especially when we've had policies in this country that um, 
create scarcity in our healthcare system, despite mm -hmm. the amount of money that we spend on healthcare as a country. Um, I think that to Kayla's question, um, stories from participants like Angel and also from um, people working in those local communities like Christy Green are really important in deciding um, or in figuring out how to address the unique needs of communities um, because people in these communities know what they're struggling with. Um, Christy Green, it was not a new issue to her that people would be um, concerned with the equity between health spending on substance use and health on diabetes. Um, she had ready answers for people who were concerned about, you know, the issues of access to free needles for diabetics. Um, and she also was working in local government and working with law enforcement to destigmatize substance use and also work towards creative solutions. Um, one thing that she has done um, to do this is to start incorporating syringe exchange programs into regular services at the public health clinic. So when folks come in and to get um, to get clean needles, they can also get regular uh, checkups, right? Um, and not only are those folks accessing more comprehensive health care in the process, but it also avoids stigmatizing images like long lines of people waiting after hours at the clinic to receive syringes. Um, I, I think she does a really good job of teaching us how to address these concerns empathetically because substance use in communities is really complex. A lot of people, um, a lot of people struggle with substance use and also a lot of people have family members with substance use and it creates a lot of pain in a community. Um, but um, addressing those concerns doesn't mean saying that they're correct, that they're ready, uh, that, it, you know, we shouldn't have syringe exchange programs. Instead, it means figuring out ways to like empathetically um, address those concerns um, and avoid stigmatizing situations and make sure that you're directly helping folks in need. So, so Nora, are you telling me that if I were to go into community and say, well, uh, I know you don't like the needle exchange program, but um, it really is an evidence-based way of harm, re harm reduction for substance users. And, you know, the, the evidence really bears it out. And so we think we should do it. Um, that, that somehow Angel would not find that to be a compelling uh, argument. You know, that's, I, I don't know that, I don't know that Angel would. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I, and Angel is like a really- would say, oh, okay, well, that alleviates all my concerns about <laughs> syringes on the sidewalk. Yeah, now that I know the evidence yeah. uh, suggests this. Yeah, um, I think I think a lot of people, including Angel, are, uh, one, I think that it is a real concern for her to see syringes like at the side of, um, uh, basically, and Angel lives up a holler, and now I need to explain what a holler is. So a holler is like a I community- and oh yes, here we go. <laughs> it's basically a community that's kind of like tucked into the Appalachian foothills, um, not just foothills, but in, in other areas. Um, and it's it's pretty narrow. There's not a lot of sidewalks. Um, and it's very like windy actually when right after we interviewed Angel, um, my colleague and I got stuck in a ditch um, on our way out of the holler um, and needed, and, and actually Angel's, Angel's boyfriend ended up coming to tow us out of the holler. It was, oh, uh, awesome. it was an experience. Um, and I, I grew up in holler, so I'm very used to it. But, um, but the extended holler story has a point, which is that, um, that these are places where there's actually like, there's not trash cans or like safe places within that community for people to dispose of syringes. You know, like, um, and there's, I don't, especially in in certain parts of Eastern Kentucky, there's a lot of like litter. There's just like not the same kind. If you're in downtown Ann Arbor, like if you walk a block, you're gonna find like a trash can. Um, if you're in a more rural part of the community, there might not be a trash can there, especially one that would be like safe to dispose of needles in. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily know that being like, you know, Angel, this is an evidence-based practice. Um, it's the National really Academies of Health say <laughs> you should do this. No? That yes. I, I think that Angel would probably, 
I mean, her her response to us was basically, um, you know, I know this, I've been there, like, people need to hit rock bottom before they're able mm-hmm. to recover from addiction. And I think she would still find that to be something um, that is unfair. But I think that if we had, you know, like, if we could remove the conversation around scarcity, if people didn't have to feel like they were um, competing with other disadvantaged Mm -hmm. folks um, for- Take a um, more universalist approach. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the thing is like, I I know a lot of people can get free needles um, Mm -hmm. if they have diabetes, um, you know, especially through the Medicaid um, program. But when we were in Kentucky last year, we were, in a time where Medicaid was under attack by the local government, or not the local government, the state government. Um, people were actively losing their health care um, uh, if they were not working 20 hours a week or volunteering 20 hours a week. Um, and so, it, you know, to create a system in which people are not competing with one another for very basic needs um, mm-hmm. is, is probably the way to go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, hey, Ayla's got a, a video question that is along these lines. And then I'm going to ask all of you, we've got nine more minutes. I've got you for nine more minutes. So um, we're just going to try to do like sort of fairly quick answers to all the questions that have come in. So uh, Trevor, go ahead. Hi, my name is Ayla. I'm a student in the School of Nursing. So my question is regarding your work with rural communities. So I'm curious what solutions have been suggested by community leaders and community members about improving access to healthcare in deeply disadvantaged rural communities. Nora, any thoughts on, um, so I think we've talked about trust building and uh, you talked about sort of co-locating, right, is sort of one strategy with the needle exchange is having some other services there as well, uh, a more universalist approach. Any other thoughts come to mind on um, sort of improving healthcare delivery for rural areas? Yeah, um, I, I think one thing that stands out is making sure that people, um, people working in public health have access to the kinds of grant funding they need to improve um Mm -hmm. to improve the services um actually um uh someone i'm close to jan johnson uh who is eastern kentucky's WIC director actually used our index um in order to advocate for um eastern kentucky to to have a better shot at receiving grant proposals by basically saying um that there needed to be a longer turnaround time for grant proposals for coming from um Mm -hmm. uh uh to support WIC and other kinds of um, interventions, because yeah. um, basically she was saying that the way that grant proposals work right now um, don't assess me, they assess resources. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen all all across the board that they're um, actually like philanthropy, there's an, uh, the wrong relationship with community poverty uh, and philanthropy where the the lower the poverty, actually, typically more philanthropy. And so a lot of the communities that we're in actually have, they don't have access and they don't have access to grant writers to sort of go after grants. And if they do, they, you know, it's the same person who's running the agency. So there's a capacity issue that actually, I think places like Poverty Solutions could help with. Let's turn to Desiree uh, has a great question. There's such a strong narrative of blame when it comes to how Americans discuss poverty. How does this project contribute to changing the ways that we conceptualize it? Maybe I'll, I'll sort of cue that up for uh, Jasmine or Meg, if you have any thoughts. I can start us off if that works. Okay. Um, I do think that this project has power because our entire role in the field is just to facilitate people telling their own stories. It's not like us giving anyone a voice. It's just kind of amplifying um, people telling their own experiences. And so I think that that's um, a way that we kind of change the game a little bit that I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, and to add on to that, I would say um, by focusing on policy solutions at the structural level, um, I think we're less concerned with um, changing people's behavior and more so making uh, the structures that people have to encounter 
um, much more amenable to a variety of behavioral situations rather than asking individuals to change their behavior. I'll just add to that, um, that the, the question of history really is striking to me on this, right? When you look at, when you look at a map from 1860 and it tells you a virtually identical story when looking at enslavement to deep disadvantage in um, the you know, 2010 to 2020, it's impossible to say anyone who was born you know, after the 1990s or you know, whenever, 100 years, 150 years later, can be individually responsible for that, right? So I think it really speaks to me, at least, that like this isn't just like you know last decade structures. These are structures that are living with us, and and we're seeing these so associations with uh, enslavement, with segregation, um, with violence, right? And uh, um, somebody had a really great question. I think Sasha had a really great question about how this compares with the. Uh, Sasha Rose, how does this compare with the uh, multidimensional poverty index out of Oxford uh, University? Actually, I just had an hour and 45 minute sort of working group session with them on Wednesday, along with sort of the head of equity for the World Health Organization. So we talked about this, so it's a great exchange and sort of two important things is the multidimensional poverty index still looks at individuals, while, where, where is at the community level? And also, um, the most interesting sort of difference was in our inclusion of mobility, right? And they, um, I, by the way, like a lot of our work is inspired by the by the multidimensional um, in poverty index. Uh, so we're big, you know, we think that's an important work. Uh, the the piece we add is trying to look at the community level and also uh, mobility, right? So they were saying that's sort of a relative measure. And we're just finding that sometimes that has the strongest association. So if you wanna look at the strongest association of anything in our data set with violent crime today, it's not inequality, which is often sort of lifted up, that the Gini coefficient explains about 6% of the variation in community level violence. And these all, all preliminary estimates. That mobility index by Hendren and Chetty uh, explains like 20% of the variation in violent crime across the United States, which is like a huge percentage. And I think speaks to a different theory, right? When people, when people are sort of inhibited from living healthy and productive lives, when they're inhibited from like knowing that they can like um, pursue the lives they want to pursue and, and not be mobile, I think other things happen, right? And um, so, we think that's a really important sort of new piece of the puzzle. We have a, a question from uh, Leonie May. How do you hope uh, local and regional governance structures, governance structures could use your research to develop poverty policies that alleviate poverty? How do we have policy impact? Mm -hmm. Jasmine and Meg, you could talk about your work on the community asset map. Yeah, um, well, I think one of the things we hope and that Nora sort of already mentioned is that people will use the index actually at the local level to design their own policy solutions. Okay. I think that that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. And then what Meg and I are doing, and Meg, feel free to expand here, is that um, we're just sort of on call for the local coordinating council when they need um, any access to data that they could help with grant writing so that they can design their own policies. We're not really trying to advocate for them. We believe that we should simply empower them to advocate um, with data. And um, in this specific instance, we're working with, on a map of, of um, local assets, uh, but I hope that we'll be doing a lot more with them. Yeah. I would say that our partnership with the Marion County Coordinating Council has been just a great opportunity where we, we were able to find a partnership that's sort of mutually beneficial where Jasmine and I were able to find a grant within the University of Michigan that this partnership would um, be considered eligible for and pursue those funds. So that was a, a good connection. But um, I think in a broader sense, looking at disaster recovery in Marion County has really made me understand that when you're designing a program, um, that's been meant to give out benefits of any type, especially if you're working with people who um, are low income, have not, have been systematically um, 
kept from amassing wealth, for example, uh, it's really important to understand that these communities face additional barriers when accessing these programs. And so you need to have flexibility and you need to um, short application windows don't work. Uh, long convoluted application processes don't work. You need to be able to do a lot of outreach and have a lot of flexibility in order to make um, these types of programs successful. I just got a, a message um, from Karen, uh, Lauren, and Trevor. They feel good about going past one. Now, of course, they're not actually presenting. Um, so I'm glad they feel good about it. Uh, <laughs> I feel good about it. I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask two more questions. And I know if, if you all uh, had something you need to get to, please feel free to, to pop off in the audience, too. So um, I think these are really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to tie two together, actually, here. Often people in the mat's hop spots of the clusters that we talked about maintain individualizing ideologies. Um, so I haven't actually seen data that suggests that's true, but um, you know, I think it might fit. I wonder what you all was saying. So he's thinking like bootstrap, self-blame, no government health. Um, were these maintained in the circumstances that you see or were they exceptions? So, you know, we asked a really interesting question about like what could government do that would help. Um, and what what were some of the responses that you all got, or, or more broadly, what do you think about uh, Matthew's question? I can start. Um, this was something that was really surprising to me because I think, as Jasmine said, we all really focus on structures um, and understand the role of structures in forming poverty in the United States. And I think. I was surprised that when we would speak to people, we did get a fair number of responses that they would talk about structure, but they would also talk about mindset. And I wasn't really expecting that, but by mindset, they did mean that people just need to um, like pull themselves up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, which I do think is just such a pervasive American ideology that it, it comes up at, at all different levels. But if I could push a little in a, a different direction on this question, when, when you all would ask, uh, what could a foundation do? What could government do? Um, I think people had very low assessment of them, of any of those types of entities having any ability to have a positive impact on the community. Do you think it was all because they thought these problems were individualized or, are, or is there other pieces of the puzzle there? I think there's definitely both. Um, as I said, the responses were both mindset and um, and structural, but I do think that there's there's still kind of a perception that things that happen at the state level are far off, things that happen at the federal level are kind of far off. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe a bit of a disbelief that these sort of entities can make a change at the local level. Mm -hmm. and some and direct experience of uh, it not going so when they do. Jasmine? Yeah, just to add, um, I think it, it also, we have to ask the question of where those narratives come from. So if mm -hmm. these narratives are spatially concentrated, why? Um, and so I think one thing I sort of thought about while we were in Marion County, as we did hear people bring up mindset and generational behavior patterns, I wonder like, where did that come from? Did that come when they were just trying to seek aid and someone mm -hmm. presenting that narrative back? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a great question, but it's really hard to answer without also thinking about why people make that in the first place. Yeah. I'm gonna end with Holly Smith and, and just invite you, I'm gonna start with Nora and just go across uh, all three. She asks, what uh, can individuals do, student families, private organizations uh, to help uh, disadvantaged communities like the ones that uh, you all have been telling us about? Nora, any sort of one idea of, of a way to help? I think this is like just such a, a cliche answer, Holly. I'm very sorry, um, but I think I think one main takeaway is to just start start by listening to what those communities need. There are people in these communities who are working on all of the issues that we've talked about, um, and uh, providing. I think often people provide resources that they feel good about, um, hmm. but not necessarily that do the most aid. Um, one example in like, like a very tiny example of this is, um, is when people donate like canned food 
um, and, and, or they, they want to donate canned food, they want to donate water to places that are hit by disasters or um, some other kind of poverty um, or uh, crisis. When the when actually donating the money that you spent mm -hmm. on that canned mm -hmm. food would have mm -hmm. gone further. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think making sure to listen to local communities, um, listen to a variety of voices from local communities. Um, so there are a lot of people who, there are a lot of different opinions within every community about what kind of aid is needed um, is, is I think what I would yeah. suggest to start with. Mm -hmm. Jasmine, anything to add? Um, I think I would just say, uh, we're probably never as far from these issues as you think. And so um, starting with the communities that you are in and just going back to what Nora said, really listening first before you act, um, it's probably the best place to start. I was, uh, I was thinking exactly along the same line. So definitely don't think of disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities as something that's, that's far off or maybe only in the South after looking at our map. Um, but they're really scattered everywhere. Um, I do think that we have to center listening, but also um, voting and political participation. Like if there are um, politicians or policymakers who are advancing equity, um, who are considering income inequality, these types of things, we need to be thinking about that at the federal level, the state level and the local level. And so your vote can actually go a long way towards changing um, structures in this election year. Okay. Uh, Jasmine, Nora, Meg, thanks so much for spending the hour with me. It was a real treat. And uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in and has stuck with us for seven more minutes. We really appreciate that. I think next week I am not on the slate. So if you're tired of me, you can still come back next week and not have to have to worry. Um, but I know we've got Ariel Khalil coming back, who's, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of, and I think it's going to be another really exciting uh, session. So same bat time, same bat channel next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.